Hello and welcome to this video on the application of private nuisance. This video is on the paper 2 for tort law for AQA and of course we're looking to see whether we can apply the law to any particular situation. Now a quick one, no worth example in this video, if you want to look for a worth example there are others in the occupier's liability in the rounds of Fletcher and the negligence videos for example and you can see how we structure the responses. What we're doing here is looking at the key questions and how we would go about applying the law. So the first thing we need to do in any application of nuisance, and private nuisance in this case, is to consider who the claimant is. So this is a person who is, who has rather, a legal interest in the land. So usually after Hunter and Canary Wharf, this is somebody who has a ownership of the land or is a tenant. Now the defendant is the creator of the nuisance. Now this can happen in a number of different ways. So it can be the occupier as well, who continues the activities of the creator. Um, and indeed we can have defendants who are coming to land unaware, but then don't do anything to stop the nuisance happening. Now indeed landlords can also be liable for the actions of tenants if they authorize or approve the actions of tenants. So you can pause at this stage if you're using this to help you with the application and just to identify some key cases uh, if you need to read the facts. But they are explained on a different video, so look to the explanation of private nuisance for that one. Now, Hunter and Canary Wolf, Sedley, Denfield, and O'Callaghan, Tetley and Chitty are some key cases for this element of the law. Now, in terms of application, this is where we need to focus most of our work on. So, AO1, the assessment objective 1 for AQA, is indeed explanation now AO2 is the application AO3 is the analysis and evaluation but in reality the analysis and evaluation is actually extended application or a discussion of the the key or contentious elements so we need to make sure we're familiar with these and if, indeed for this first element uh, we have to see what legal interest does the claimant have in the land so be specific are they an owner are they a tenant or do they not have an interest in the land is the defendant the creator of the nuisance? In what way are they responsible? So are they the creator? Are they allowing it to happen? Are they the owner and the tenant causing the, the nuisance? And so we need to conclude, is the defendant a valid defendant? Now, of course, it would be daft if they weren't in your scenario, but we need to show the examiner that we do need, we know this particular issue. We know who is the claimant, who is the defendant. So the first main element, the body, then we need to consider an interference. So this interference needs to be a continuous interference rather than a one-off occurrence. So of course we have cases where one-off occurrences are still nuisances, but that's usually where physical damage is has happened. Claims in private nuisance cover two types then. So we have physical damage to the land for which claims are usually and easily or easier to, to prove. And there is loss of amenity or convenience in using the land. So if this could be because the uh, excessive noise, for example, preventing sleep or there's unpleasant smells or fumes preventing the claimant from opening his windows or even using his garden or putting washing out, for example. So some key cases, again, you can pause this stage if you want to run through these, but Holbeck, Wheeler, Kennaway, Miller. Um, and of course, other cases uh, look at ideas like fumes, flooding, vibrations, hot air, oily smut and fire. There's many different ways in which interference can happen. So if it fits within this boundary in your scenario, you're good to go. And so what we need to do when we're applying the law, um, this will be where the contentious issue is, potentially at least. Is it an indirect, indirect interference? So outline specifically what actions or incidents make this a nuisance. So is it oily smut coming onto land? Has damage happened, occurred to the property because of the nuisance of the defendant and so on? So be very specific, pick it out from the scenario. Now is the claim for physical damage to land, as in not the person, or is it loss of immunity? Remember, physical damage to the person cannot be claimed for under this tort. So we need then to consider, is the interference unlawful? Now this pretty much just means unreasonable, because the reality is people have the right to use their own land however they wish. But there is a limit beyond which activities become unlawful because we need to consider the balancing interest between the claimants and the defendant in being able to use their land. So the court asks what, whether the nuisance interferes with ordinary existence and is the impact on the claimant so unreasonable 
that he or she should not be expected to put up with it. And the courts have developed some tests in terms of the six factors they will use in deciding whether it's unreasonable to include the fact that certain activities will be lawful uh, and in some set the same sentence but, but not in others. So we do need to consider a balancing of these and we need to use case law to support as much as possible in your application because invariably they will be based on real cases or at least inspired by them. Just a point on these unreasonableness factors then before we discuss them is no one factor is more important than the other. What we need to consider is which ones apply. Okay, so we don't look to every single one, but we need to have them in our minds in applying the law into that in, in the exam situation. So, for example, if we look to sensitivity of the claimant, now if the claimant is using this property of extra sensitive use, then unless it would affect the reasonable person, it's not probably going to be a nuisance. We need to consider the locality of the events as well. So, locality of the events as something is more or likely or less likely to be a nuisance depending on where it is. So we need to consider a few factors there. We need to consider whether it is a residential neighbourhood or industrial neighbourhood. You expect some things to occur in industrial neighbourhoods. You wouldn't in residential. The same for towns or cities, villages and so on. So you need to take into account the place. And that will be described in the scenario, it's a sleepy village or it's in a busy industrial estate and then you could of course use that to, to help you. Now the duration of the nuisance really is two things here. The first is the courts are more likely to consider a nuisance unreasonable if it lasts for a long time or occurs during the sociable hours. So it's one of those two things, usually together of course as well. Now a single event, if it causes property damage, can amount to a nuisance. We've seen this in some cases too. Now it does, we need to be aware that it needs to have a big impact, it needs to affect materially the, the loss of immunity, it needs to affect the claimant in a particular way. Now the social utility is more, acts more like a defence. So just because something is considered useful to society, it doesn't mean that a remedy is not available in nuisance, okay? So on the one hand it acts as a defence, but on the flip side, um, it may just provide an alternative remedy. So social utility is, for example, if we have a sports stadium or a playground, that will provide more benefit to the local area than it is a nuisance. And so there's a sort of sliding scale. This may act as a full defence. But if we look, for example, at Dennis and the Ministry of Defence, um, actually provides a different remedy instead. In this case, damages was the remedy rather than stopping the Ministry of Defence flying the, the, the jets. Now the malice just means um, if there's something done deliberately to annoy the claimant then it's more likely to succeed, it's more likely to be a nuisance. So once again we can use any of these key cases, you can pause and read through any of these. We've got McKinnon, Sturgis, St. Helens Smelting, Bolton and Stone, Crown River Cruises, Dennis, Hollywood, Silver Fox Farm and also Christine Davy. So you can look to any of those, they're in the similar order to the, the past slide in terms of the point they prove, but certainly the facts will help you, as will the previous video on private nuisance. So in application again, this is where we need to do most of our work. So what we need to consider then is, did the nuisance interfere with ordinary existence? So remember, not sensitive claimants. Be explicit as to how. Okay, and perhaps comment as to the effect it actually had on the claimant. We need to ask also, is it so unreasonable that the claimant should not be expected to put up with it? And you can make that judgment. If you think it's unreasonable, then use your gut feeling on that and run with that argument. You should, of course, link it to cases, but invariably you're going to get a feeling because of what you studied so far. You also need to consider some of the factors which may alter uh, whether the interference was unreasonable. So remember, not every single one of these factors will be taken into account. Um, and some are sort of for the defender, some are for the claimant. We make a balanced argument at the end of looking through all of them. And once we've established if there is a satisfactory claim in private nuisance, we then need to consider any possible defences. Now. There are three specific defences for private nuisance. So we have prescription, statutory authority and act of God. 
prescription then uh, we look to if no complaint has taken place in 20 years then it becomes a prescriptive right so if nobody has ever challenged a person on doing what they're doing in a nuisance of drilling or smells for example then it becomes a prescriptive right which just means they're allowed to do it so this acts as a right now if the claimant moves to the nuisance then this can sort of undermine the defense because of course the nuisance only starts when the person moves to the nuisance it might if it wasn't a nuisance already now statutory authority means if acti activity is regulated by license or licensed by sorry environmental or other laws statutory authority could be an effective defense so this can include for example planning permission if you have planning permission and the planning permission is aware that there's going to be some sort of nuisance then of course it could be an effective defense and then we've got active gold this is an unforeseeable weather event um, perhaps a little difficult to prove now given we have all the information we need about the weather at our fingertips but of course the act of god still does exist as a defense so if this activity is if there's as I say an unforeseeable weather event then we need to be aware that this can actually have the effect of a defense and it's always the fault of the weather as opposed to the nuisance itself now Again, some key cases, prescription, you can use Sturgis and Bridgman, Contrary and Lawrence and Miller and Jackson, if necessary. Um, statutory authority, you can look towards Allen and Gulf Oil Refining, Marchich and Thames Water, Avila and Saunders. And Act of God, you can use cases such as Nichols, Marsland and Goldman and Hargrave to support your points. So again, the key issues here then is application. So, has the claimant in this case been continuing the nuisance for 20 years on challenge? If they have, and this is made clear in the scenario, then you can use prescription as a defence. Um, but be careful to check if the nuisance has only occurred because the claimant has come to the nuisance. So, if somebody builds a doctor's surgery outside a factory, now of course, it's only a nuisance because they built a, a different doctor's surgery. It wasn't previously that stage, Bridgman, by the way. Uh, of course, so you need to be careful of that. And again, make clear in the scenario why this is occurring. Now, we then need to consider, has the claimant been given permission from a local authority or an act of parliament? Make sure you look in that particular scenario and check, have they been given permission? Or has there been a storm or unexpected non-human event which has caused a nuisance? If so, consider using Act of God as a defence. Now, this is more likely in the problem question to come up as a defence. Okay, so in terms of remedies then, so usually damages are going to be award now, awarded now because damages are the most common remedy in tort law, as we know. And the effect of contrary in Lawrence is, although a claimant may seek an injunction, in fact, this isn't always a default now so we can of course lay both out and it would do you no harm in your application to mention the claimant may wish for an injunction for the activity to stop or the nuisance to stop but the court may award damages as an alternative following coventry and lawrence now if we have a situation where abatement is necessary because maybe there's no hanging tree or somebody needs to go into somebody's property to do something that by all means use abatement as a remedy too less likely to occur in a problem situation but we know it is a remedy so as i said there's no worked example this time around um but you can use this to work your way through the example and ask yourself those application questions to see if in fact you've spotted that in the scenario but indeed you can see models elsewhere in other videos so Thank you for watching this one and good luck in your application.